I thought we would start with a little chanting if you're up for it. If you're not, no problem. You can just listen. And chanting is a lot of things to me. It's um, become a powerful way to practice over the last year, for sure. And over many before that. But it's a practice that I've relied on more heavily in the last year. And uh, because it seems to activate a different part of the heart yeah. and really penetrate um, at times when words don't seem to don't seem to get it, at least my own words, my own language. Right? So borrowing some from the Buddha, from the um, beings who have practiced throughout time, it feels like a powerful way to connect, to find a way back to connection. And you can just imagine yourself, sometimes I'll imagine myself last in line and this whole lineage of Buddhist practitioners, some people in robes, some people wearing flannel like me, but just this whole line of people throughout time who have really just cared enough to keep showing up, not to be a perfect human being, not to even know what I'm doing, right? Not to understand the words even, or what does this mean to have a heart that yeah, abides in loving kindness. I don't know what that quite is like, but I do care enough to keep seeking. I do care enough to keep returning to the possibility of love, to the possibility of kindness, to the possibility of friendly, friendliness, even when it feels elusive or really far out of reach. And some moments it does feel far out of reach. But to chant these words and remember, ah, oh, this is what people before us, including us, this is what everybody has done. Just keep returning to this wholesome seeking, this wholesome desire to, yeah, live a skillful life. And we do this by just chanting and allowing the words to fall into our heart, not to force them there, to force the heart to be good or to understand even, but just to in, invite them in and see what happens. And then sort of surrender to the wonder and awe of it all. Like, I don't know, I don't really know how this works. I know that it makes sense to keep practicing. And, you know, I know that chanting feels good and is kind of nourishing. And definitely I can see how my day um, is impacted by various kinds of practice, including chanting, including sitting including uh, right speech and wise ethical conduct, you know, just practicing these in these ways really does turn my day around. But I don't, I don't quite know, you know, I don't quite know what the far reaching benefits are. Yeah, I don't know if tomorrow is gonna be the same or better, worse. I don't know if it's radically, radically gonna change my relationships or if I'm gonna be fully awakened in this life. I don't, I don't know. But I do know that now it makes sense. And so I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna invite the words in and I'm just gonna surrender to the possibility, to the possibility of far reaching benefits of abiding in loving kindness and see what happens. So the parentheses I'll say by myself and then you'll start um, with the next line. And when you see a little hash mark like this, it means you go down a tone. And when you see a little hash mark like this, it means you go up a tone, right? So it goes, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness, right? So you'll hear me and you'll figure it out. It's not that complex. <laughs> Okay. It always uh, felt a little funny to me to, 
to just jump, jump into chanting when I didn't really know what was happening. Why do you do that? Um, what did, why, you, why is it so monotone, you know? Because it's, it's really um, at the time of the Buddha, this is a way that was an oral tradition. So this is a way the teachings were remembered. Yeah, and people would just talk to each other, right? Chant together, talk to each other. This is what I think the Buddha meant. And then there would be arguments and discourse and conflict because nobody really knew. And yeah, and this is how the teachings were passed down. It's really quite beautiful to me that people cared enough to just keep talking about it. I mean, if we think about the things that we care enough to keep talking about, are we really, it, it, we're often talking, sometimes we're making small talk and just trying to connect with another person, but often we're talking about things we really care about, our relationships, our families, a dilemma that we have to talk to a friend about a dilemma, right? So just to kind of connect with that bit of care in the heart that often precedes our actions, our words, our deeds. And this is what people did again and again and again, chant together to remember, to remember that I care about this heart, I care about these teachings, and I'm gonna see what I can learn right now. Not that I've arrived anywhere uh, wonderful or supreme, but just that I care enough to see where this is headed, to keep returning as a seeker. Okay. Now let us chant the Buddhist words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech. Humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be. Whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born. May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies, and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, freed from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection this is said to be 
the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views the pure hearted one having clarity of vision being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. And just let the words land in the heart. It's my understanding that the Buddha taught this practice as a form of protection. Think of this as a kind of warm bath. The warmth of kindness. the protection of kindness that we might bathe in. And feel the residue of the words. Beautiful and aspirational. What's it like to aspire to abiding? in a kind of love that's boundless, spreads over the entire world, radiating from this heart outward and unbounded. You might not even know the possibility of that, you might feel hard to imagine an energy that strong. But we can feel a bit of peace or patience, maybe even a warmth, contentedness, just as we settle into this meditation. And that's a taste of the friendly quality of metta. It's actually quite light. And sometimes think about metta as it's if it's so in, like an intense feeling, but it's actually quite light, gentle. It's 
not overpowering. It's the heart that knows how to say yes to anything, really. And so as we sit here together, you might feel the warmth of the words or aspiration, like I've mentioned. But we might also feel the residue of the day. The doing energy that's still vibrating in the body. The heart might be heavy for one reason or another. Metta is that quality that allows for a connection, allows the heart to say yes to this, whatever it is. This heart pain, this agitation, this sleepiness, this warmth, discontentedness, Maybe it's as simple as receiving a sound or a body sensation. Every moment the heart is here, is infused with a little bit of metta. How nice is it to not have to go searching far and wide for love? That friendly, benevolent quality is available here and now. We're just doing what we can do to feel into the present moment. Feel the body. Know that we have a body. Feel the breaths moving in the body. Hear sounds, recognize thoughts and emotions. The heart that knows metta knows that it doesn't pay off to be tight.
The heart that's not in contention with reality. The heart that doesn't have to control. No need to do anything. Just receive. Just feel, connect. Right in the middle of this cultivation of care, benevolence, friendliness, kindness. We might use these words interchangeably. Right in the middle of this felt sense of care. We might bring to mind an image of a being who's easy to love. Just hold them in mind, whoever comes up first. Remembering their good qualities. Soak up their presence. Allow your mind to remember their goodness.
When the time is right, you can offer your gratitude and care. You can either do it, do that energetically just by sharing the merit of the heart that cares on the out breath with this being. Or if you want to, you can offer some phrases. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. Giving and receiving, receiving the goodness of this being, appreciating their good qualities and giving, offering it back. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe. And protected. May you be healthy. And strong. You can continue to work with this being, or if you're ready, you can bring to mind an image of yourself. And remembering that there's goodness in every human being. Appreciating your goodness, allowing your mind to reflect and appreciate the good qualities of your heart. Perhaps even your intention to practice to come to this group tonight. With each breath, appreciating your own goodness.
When the time is right, offering your good wishes to yourself. May I be happy and peaceful. May I be safe and protected. May I be healthy and strong. May I be happy and peaceful. Safe and protected. Healthy and strong. If ever the practice starts to feel difficult, you can return to the body. Just breathe. Remember that the heart that can say yes to this, this breath, this body, this moment, is a heart that knows metta. You're not as far off track as you think. You can just rest there as long as you want. Before you begin again.
You can remain here with your working with yourself. Or if you like, you can expand this practice to include all of the people in this room. All of the beings who care enough about living a skillful life to come here to keep seeking, seeking how to do that. Just appreciating the goodness of our collective efforts to return to practice. May we all be happy and peaceful. May we be safe and protected. May we be healthy and strong. including our family and friends and neighbors and our heartfelt appreciation and benevolent good wishes. May we all be happy and peaceful. safe and protected, healthy and strong. We can just have a felt sense of the whole group, family and friends, this community, not trying to pin down any one person, just allowing the metta to flow to everyone. And remembering that metta has no bounds. We couldn't stop it if we wanted. We'll just invite metta to flow to all the beings, all the beings above and below, around and everywhere. May we all be happy and peaceful. May we be safe and protected. May we be healthy and strong.
And opening your eyes when you're ready, coming back into the room with everyone. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Let's just take a minute to move the body, make any adjustments. You can even step away from your screen for a minute. Just to give the body a little attention, a little stretch. To me, it's really like there's a lot of faith in metta these days. Um, I think primarily because it, I just keep being amazed at how close love is. You know, in moments when the heart feels like it's on fire and, you know, there's lots of thinking and complaining and confusion and and then, you know, sit down to do a little practice and the heart can easily remember how to be good, how to care. You know, it doesn't really take that much. My dog kind of runs up and gets close to me or it looks at me a little bit or my partner's kind, just like makes me a sandwich or, you know, like I, you might've heard this too. My, my neighbors are outside laughing. Yeah, I felt really, I felt appreciative of that. Like, oh, there's some joy in their life. That's good. It just doesn't quite take that much. And it's good to remember that it's not about, you know, like my dog or the other people so much as it is about this heart's capacity to be kind, to appreciate, to be yeah. generous. Yeah, that's what's close. That's what's closer than it seems. It's a really great practice to take to like the grocery store or on the bus, or public transportation, whatever, you know, we're doing. But just to, to take, to remember just what you're saying, the immediacy of it. Like, oh, the person right in front of me, the cashier, the Uber driver, the person who's bagging my groceries. <laughs> the person who's taking this call, like it's so, it can be so, yeah, it just brings, almost brings tears to my eyes. Like, right. Somehow yeah. it's not like, yeah, it's really close. It's really immediate. It's really close. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering about just giving a little introduction. Do you want to hear a little bit about the Brahma Viharas and where this practice of loving kindness comes from? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll do a little bit of that. I've been really, you know, this, there's many ways to describe this Buddhist path of practice and, you know, different moments call for different uh, definitions. Sometimes it feels like it's a really distant or really ethical path, really pragmatic and ethical. And um, it also feels like it's really relational. It feels like it's a path of love that's really relational. And we see this again and again and again in the Buddhist teachings that um, there are these you know, moments where there's, there's a conflict or a, a dilemma. So again, like people just come to the Buddha and they ask a question like, what do I do about this? And the Buddha gives some response. And so much of the time, like sometimes the responses seem to be contradictory. They'll say this one time and then something else another time. And it feels to me like he says different things because of the person that's right in front of him, right? In some moments, the response is this because he's in a relationship with someone. And in other moments, the relationship or the response feels different because he's now in a relationship with that person and he's offering what will be useful. And so I, I feel called to that practice to really get curious about how this Buddhist path, these practices are really relational and immediate. 
very, you know, like really local? How do they apply right here? How does this make sense in my life with my children and my parents and my colleagues and my neighbors and climate disruption and racial injustice and, you know, all the things, all the unsolvable problems, the chaos in my life, right? The being too busy or not knowing what to do with my future or whatever. Like, how does the practice make sense right now? And so this is part of the inquiry, you know, that I, I, I begin with tonight just to see, oh, what's really in the room? What is it? What is it? And we can, we can see that, you know, there's this, um, a teacher who has been really important to many of the senior teachers in this tradition, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg. And Sharon is an important person to know about because she wrote this one, she's a wonderful teacher. She is one of the founding teachers of Insight Meditation Society. And she wrote this fantastic book. It's going to go down in history as one of the great Western Buddhist books. It's called Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. And so Sharon really, you know, she really has spent a lot of time practicing metta and loving kindness um, over her practice. And she, she was very close to um, this woman, Deepama, this Indian woman who really urged her to teach. She was a student of Deepama's. Deepama um, taught here in the United States. He taught, uh, she taught Joseph and uh, Jack and Sharon and many others. And at one point, uh, someone asked her a question like, what is the difference between, well, let me back up. So some of the things that people say about Deepa Ma is like, she's the most loving person I've ever met. Right? She also had these amazing, she had this very strong and amazing mind, some psychic powers, but a really concentrated, a really an art for concentration. And so she, she was very important also because she's a householder. So she was a person who raised children and she went through a lot of difficulty in her life. She was very depressed. And she was bedbound for a while. She was so depressed and had a lot of physical illness. And so for a person who deals with kind of the same things that we deal with, right? We deal with moods. <laughs> we deal with physical ailments. We deal with relationship problems. So somebody like Deepama, who was, um, if not a fully awakened being, she was pretty close. Yeah. And also the most loving person perhaps that we could meet. And at one point, one of Deepama's students asked her, what's the difference between awareness and metta? And she said, you know, perhaps there is no difference, which is important because in the beginning of the meditation, you might've recognized this. I was kind of playing with that. You know, this is this quality, this light quality of metta that sometimes feels like you know, we kind of make, we make more out of it in our mind. It's really the proliferating mind that makes more out of it. The mind that wants to create a bigger story about something than it actually, than it actually needs. So metta is this very light, friendly, benevolent quality of heart that can simply say yes, right? And from that place of yes, then it deepens and grows. And then we can feel into the benevolent depth of metta that is boundless and unbound, you know, boundless and uh, can feel like it can wash over everything. Like there's nothing outside of the, uh, of the realm of where metta can reach, right? That's where we get the protective, the holy protective qualities of metta. But it begins as this really uh, simple, heartfelt, oh yes, just this, right? Just this, just sitting here, just being here in this meeting, just listening, just feeling the body, just being honest about the worry in my mind, being honest about the despair in my mind, or being honest about grief, or being honest about joy or happiness, right? or being honest about chaos, not pretending. These are all ways to describe that quality of yes, that connects with this, that very 
simple quality of yes. And if we try to tease out, you know, it's very difficult to tease out. Well, is that metta or is that awareness? Is that being aware? Is that being mindful? Yeah. And in my experience, in order for the heart to be mindful, the heart has to have a little bit of metta there, right? Because it's it's hard for the heart to at this simultaneously resist what's right in front of me and say yes to it at the same time. So the heart that's resisting life cannot be aware, right? Because we're just caught up in the resist. Like mm. we can be aware of the resistance, but then there's metta again, right? But if we're just if we're driven by compulsivity, by compulsive behavior or um, impulse impulses, just seeking pleasant experience and pushing away what's unpleasant, then we're not really being real, right? We're sort of pretending. We're pretending that life is supposed to, that experience is supposed to deliver the goods, supposed to make us happy. But metta is this quality of yes that can say, that can meet any experience because we understand that life is not just one thing, right? And this vast world is full of a lot of things. And so if we're pretending, if we're only seeking pleasant experience, we're pretending that that's what we deserve or that's, what's, that's what is supposed to be there. And by doing that, we're negating that life is many things. Life is 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows and all the confusion in between, right? So this heart that can actually say yes is, is really deeply wise. It knows like, oh, life is many things. If I'm only expecting life to bring joy, then I'm gonna be really disappointed. If I'm only expecting life to bring misery, then I'm gonna miss all the beautiful moments, right? And so this heart that can say yes, is this is the actually the heart that's infused with that kind of wisdom, we might call this equanimity. So there are four flavors of metta, four kinds. We might call these, this is what the Buddha called the four Brahma Viharas, the four uh, divine abodes, or uh, we can call them really healthy dwelling places. So this quality, this light quality of metta, that's the first one, that's just simply this yes. And then the fourth one is equanimity. That's equanimity brings with it a little bit of wisdom. Right? Like life is not just one thing, sweetie. You're only seeking pleasant as if to pretend like life is just one thing or like somehow I deserve pleasant experience. I deserve just to be happy all the time. Well, that doesn't make any sense for me just to, to not be moved by the suffering in the world. Of course, I'm gonna be moved by the suffering in the world. And that's probably gonna make me sad, right? If I'm being honest, or I might feel you know disappointed or whatever, relationships are difficult. So I might be distressed about something. Well, why wouldn't that be true, right? I'm a human being, just like we all are. So this equanimity is really rooted in, ah, life is not just one thing. And there, are, if I'm, and if I'm on this path to be honest, to not pretend, then I really care to connect with the fullness, the richness, the completeness of life. The Pali word for this is sama. Sometimes it's translated as right or wise, but it can also be translated as complete, right? We might call this complete, a complete view, right? And then true happiness would be right in the middle of this capacity to say yes to all of it. That's what we might call equanimity. Upeka is the Pali word, and it means to stand up in the middle of all this. So if we're able to appreciate that life is not just one thing and then expecting it to be one thing is gonna be really disappointing because we're eventually gonna see that it's so much more than that. Then, then we're gonna be, you know, cause we're gonna, eventually gonna see that it's gonna be so much more than that. 
So equanimity appreciates the fullness of life. And we learn how to flow with it, how to not hold on to any of the things because everything is always changing. Just like the experience right in front of us is always changing, right? If I expect that I'm gonna be in love with my wife from now and for every single moment of my life until the day I die, I'm gonna be disappointed. Because there's some moments, if I'm being honest and not pretending, that it's not that feeling of being in love. It's, it's a lot more mundane than that, right? It might be <laughs> being frustrated or it might just be feeling content or it might be a whole lot of other things. Right, so it doesn't pay dividends for us to pretend that a relationship or anything is just one thing. Yeah, so equanimity is the wisdom that truly understands this and values not pretending because, it's, because it, it benefits the sustainability that we have to be in our lives no matter what comes. Okay? No, what, no matter what challenges, no matter what joys, because we're not holding on. We're expecting them to. We're expecting everything to come and go. Oh, this is what all things, this is, everything is always changing. Life is just not one thing. So when I realize that I'm not feeling a lot of love for my partner, what I'm feeling is frustration right now. It's not such a big deal. It's like, oh, this is just frustration, sweetie, because relationships are never just one thing. Everything is always changing. And so this too is the way it goes in relationship with other humans, right? Or when another human does something that I find despicable. So I don't need to somehow throw that human out of my heart or pretend like they don't exist. I can actually feel into that despicable act and go, oh yeah, I'm a human too. I know how this goes. I do despicable things too. Because humanity is many things. Humanity is all the beautiful qualities of mind that manifest in the collective. And humanity is the greed and the hatred and the delusion that also comes forward in moments when we're not paying attention. Yeah. So compassion is the second quality, the second of the Brahma Baharas. And this is the quality of love that meets suffering. So we don't have to throw other humans out of our heart because we can feel the wisdom. Wisdom knows that, oh, human beings are a mixed bag, right? I know that's true because I'm a mixed bag and all the people I love are also mixed. Some beauty, some challenging aspects, right? some things that I really appreciate, some things I don't like at all, some things that are healthy, some qualities that are very unhealthy. And generally, we do the best that we can. Right? So compassion also feels into this, right? Compassion is love that meets suffering, but there's, and there's also some wisdom there that knows it really doesn't make sense to discard other human beings because I'm not that different. So we've got metta and equanimity, the first and the fourth. Compassion is the second. And then the third one is like under, you know, the most underrated of the four, in my opinion. And it's one, it's great. I love mudita, a gladness or appreciative joy. This is the quality of love that appreciates the goodness, the good fortune of others, actually appreciates the good qualities in others because we can see how beneficial they are. So it's like noticing, oh, this, is, this person is really generous. How wonderful it is to be generous. I can see how your generosity will be of great benefit to you in your life. And I feel really glad about that. That's mudita right? Or it's like, wow, you just got a promotion. Wow, that is really going to benefit you. Having the resources to take care of yourself and your family, that's going to be really beneficial. I appreciate the way that you've accepted that promotion and the goodness, you know, that you're going to be able to 
do good things with that. Yeah. So mudita is this appreciative joy. So metta, compassion, four like four sides of the same cube, right? Just four different flavors of love. So you might not like that word love. I like it because it's um, I like it because it's it's direct and and uh, we have some association with that word. And it's also really loaded. So it might mean different things to different people. So if it's not, if it's like doesn't quite fit, you can throw it out. The poly, the word um, that was used to describe these practices is metta, M-E-T-T-A. It is this very friend, friendly, benevolent care, this heart that can say yes, very simple, right? And then karuna is the Pali word for compassion. And that's just this heart that meets suffering. Often metta and karuna um, are really close together. They can sometimes get confused even because depending on our personality habits, right? We might, we might recognize metta as soon as metta meets suffering. And so miss the friendliness, miss that lightness there. We'll, we'll often miss that lightness and tune right into the suffering and then feel it like, oh yeah. Yeah, so these two can be, sometimes feel a bit interchangeable. And then mudita for appreciative joy or gladness or sympathetic joy sometimes is how it's called. And then the fourth one, equanimity or upeka is the Pali word. One of uh, a teacher that I've appreciated a lot, her name is Jill Shepherd. Um, you can find many of her Dharma talks on Dharma Seed. And uh, she teaches a lot about the Brahmi Viharas and I've learned a lot from her. She, she talks about metta as strengthening, as a, a way of strengthening our natural resilience. To be better able to meet life's challenges. It's really hard to feel like we are going to collapse under life, the weight of life when the heart has, is, has the lightness of metta or when the heart feels compassionate. You can maybe think back to a time in your life that you felt, you've really felt deep care not distress, but care over someone's suffering, that it's really, it might be, you know, hard to feel someone suffering, but when you're right there with it, when we imagine, you know, someone suffering, it might be hard, but when we're right there with it, it actually isn't that hard. So my dog fell down the stairs, some weeks ago, she's doing much better now, but she was, she had a back injury and I was noticing the mind that went back and forth between connecting with the, you know, the, the pain that she must be in when she was limpy and feeling oh, like the heart really cares about that. And then also tipping into this kind of pity or worry, which is not the same thing as compassion. But the moment when the heart was like, oh yeah, sweetie, let me take care of you. Let me watch you walk so that if you approach the stairs, I can be there for you. That's compassion. But when the mind was like obsessively worrying about what to do and what's gonna happen, then it was a little bit more controlling. Like I'm trying to prevent the body from doing what the body does and naturally aging. So we can play with the distinctions here. Like what, what feels like compassion? Does it have the lightness and then suffering is there, but it's not controlling or somehow trying to dominate or pretend like this isn't really happening. 
Yeah, just as an example. There's really something very poignant about the end, end, the end of life. I was with my mother-in-law when she passed and yeah, the finality of it. There's no escaping, there's no resolving, right? We, we are helpless. And some, you know, there were many moments with my mother-in-law when I felt like, oh, the only thing I can do is care. I cannot control this process is just going the way it will go. I don't really know what the next thing is gonna be. You know, there are many moments over those final days that it's hard to know what's gonna happen next. And we can feel like, really feel the poignancy of, con you know, of um, care, you know, the distinction between care and control. I could feel easily feel like, oh, this is about me, not wanting to let go or, being really un being uncomfortable with the discomfort, right? Well, should we do another chant before we end together then? What do you think about that? Yeah, all right. Let's go back to the chant book. And... We'll go to the um, suffusion of divine abidings. So the way the Buddha taught these practices, the Brahma Viharas, he taught um, the radiating the goodness of heart, like radiating the energy in four directions, above and below. You know. And so this is how this chant is is written and uh, how people remembered the teachings. I will abide pervading one quarter, like one quarter this way, one quarter that way, above and below, one quarter this way, one quarter that way, right? And just a for reference to help us understand what we're reading here. <clears throat> it's a fusion of divine abidings. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere. And to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with the mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere. And to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with the mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere. And to all as to myself, I will abide 
pervading the all-encompassing world with the mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with the mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Thank you so much, friends. It's, it can never hurt to spend the night reflecting on practicing metta together. So thanks for being here for it.